everyone and welcome, welcome, welcome to our next episode of Wisdom of the Mystics. I'm Reverend Kathy Mastriani, Executive Director of the Science of Mind Archives and Library Foundation. And it truly is a joy and honor to be here with y'all as we, we really delve into the history of new thought. We go even deeper into the wisdom of the mystics that are the foundation of our teaching and our lives and why we're here today. And this wisdom uplifts us, uplevels us, and brings us such joy. And so it's my honor to be here today with our beloved Laura Topper. Oh, hello, Reverend Kathy, and yes, it's wonderful to be here. Welcome to everybody that is joining us live here on New Thought Media Network for our exciting broadcast today, where we are welcoming an incredible teacher and leader, New Thought leader and, um, and scholar somebody that is here to really shine his light on the teachings from the perspective of knowing um, uh, the, the mystics that really, really influenced uh, life and his own teachings. So I'm really excited, Reverend Kathy, to be here with our super guest today. Would you like to introduce him? I, it'd be my honor. So this is truly a scholar of Thomas Troward. He is a student of New Thought. And when this is Dr. Tom Sanner, and when he was 17 years old, he had a mystical experience himself. He felt himself enfolded in an absolute, universal, and unconditional love. And he knew that regardless of what appeared in the relative world, that everything was unfolding in perfect right order. And he found this teaching of science of mind and spirit. And in learning about Ernest Holmes, he found uh, Thomas Troward. And he has written the, this comprehensive book on Thomas Troward. He's been a scholar of Troward since 1977. And without further ado, I'd like to bring on our show, Dr. Tom Sanner. Here Yes. Hi, how's everybody? It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Hello. Welcome to Wisdom of the Mystics, Dr. Dr. Sano. It's just such an honor for you for us uh, being here with you to learn and understand more of the mystic that you you absolutely know a lot about uh, Thomas Trower. Thank you for sharing today. Oh, you're welcome. And the, the first thing that comes into my mind is that uh, that nobody knows any more about spirit than anybody else. In fact, Ernest Holmes said nobody nobody whispered anything into my ear that it wasn't equally available to everybody. It's just that sometimes people don't listen. And um, so, so uh, it's not it's not that I have any uh, special knowledge that isn't available to others. It's just that I, it's just what you put your attention on. And, and, uh, I happen to, to decide to put a lot of attention on, uh, reading all of the works of Troward and then, and then kind of synthesizing them. So, uh, hopefully they could be understood by, uh, by others and, and, and see that they are the theoretical that that the works of Troward are the theoretical basis of the teaching of science of mind and spirit. Thank you. And we would love to hear who was Thomas Troward? What was he like as a person in the world? 
Well, uh, Tro, uh, Troward was born in, actually in the Punjab region of India. His parents were in the uh, Indian civil service. Uh, he spent his early years until he was about six years old uh, in India. And then it was traditional at that time uh, w for uh, British people uh, to come back to England. And, and uh, Troward came back with his mother uh, to England, uh, where he studied from the time he was six until the time he was 17 or 18 uh, in Great Britain, and he had a classical British education. Uh, and then uh, when he was 18 years old, he studied what was called, um, or 18 or 19, he studied what was called the uh, Indian Civil Service Examination, uh, and that based on that examination, he received an appointment uh, soon getting to the position where he was an assistant commissioner, which is kind of like a superior court judge in, in uh, America. He, he was an assistant commissioner in the Punjab region, and, he, and from the age 22 until um, 55 years old, he actually uh, was a judge, and uh, he had a lot of different people come into his courtroom, and he and during that period of time, he learned um, he learned all the dialects of the of the Indian people, and uh, he 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 had a had an inclination towards towards mysticism anyway, and so he incorporated that those that that mystic those mystical ideas into very practical ideas of uh, what he learned about in India, and of course. Uh, of course, he decided, and, and it, that a lot of people know that there is only one truth, but uh, there are many different ways of approaching it. And so, uh, Troward approached it, tried to show that there, that there is only one spiritual truth. And then, when he was fifty-five, he then um, uh, came back to England, and he his intention at that time was simply to retire and paint. He was a painter. And um, he was um, he he didn't have any uh, idea that he was going to get involved in the in what was called at that time the higher thought movement. Uh, and uh, the story is is that he was in an in an English tea room um, w uh, when he was fif about fifty six years old, and it was quite crowded in there. And there was a woman that was sitting next to him. Uh, and he was he was writing. He he always wrote uh, uh, about things himself. And she she glanced over at what he was writing, and she said to him, "Now this is these are who, who knows if this is actually true. This work came, this these ideas came from a man named uh, Harry Gazy, uh, who studied uh, Troward. And he said the the woman said uh, her name was Alice Callow." And, she, and uh, she said to him, sir, I see that you are writing higher thought. And he said to her, madam, I don't know what you're talking about because he, he wasn't familiar with that terminology. Uh, but at any rate, uh, she, she recognized in him some kind of expertise and invited him to the Higher Thought Society. Uh, for the first year that he came, um, he kind of sat in the background and then they realized the people of the Higher Thought Society realized that he knew more than any of them. Uh, and so they continued to ask him to speak. And then in 1904, they asked him if he would give a series of lectures in Edinburgh, Scotland. And that was the first set of lectures called the Edinburgh Lectures um, that, he, that he gave. Um, now, in those days, uh, in those days, you didn't... Um, you didn't speak uh, extemporaneously. You you wrote down everything that you were going to say, and then you read what you wrote. Well, anybody who has read the Edinburgh Lectures knows that it's kind of obtuse language, and it's kind of difficult to understand. So because most of the people couldn't understand what he was really talking about, they asked him to produce it in a, in a book format. And so uh, so he did. Um, and he uh, created quite a following, uh, and this was in 1904, 1905. 
1912, there was a, a five foot three and a half, five foot four inch uh, sort of pudgy young man, uh, about 28 years old, uh, in Venice, California. And his name was Ernest Holmes. And he picked up this uh, Edinburgh Lectures uh, that was in written form, and he started reading it. And um, he had prepared himself for these kinds of things. And so he knew he knew what Troward was talking about. And he realized that Troward had provided him with the theoretical framework for science of mind. And so uh, in 1912, um, Holmes read this material. And then it was a couple of years later, by 1914, that Holmes started giving his first lectures on the Edinburgh Lectures and other works of Troward. He wrote, he, there was another uh, set of called the Doré Lectures. And, uh, and uh, so uh, Holmes gave lectures on that, and people realized how profound um, Thomas Troward really was. So Troward... Uh, Troward set out a, a, an entire series of what it is like for for uh, intelligence and consciousness to move from what was called the simple consciousness. Uh, he he said the entire universe was alive, and there were gradations of consciousness from simple consciousness to complex consciousness, and it went through the plants to the animals to to um, to humans, and then uh, Troward said that there was another level called the divine kingdom, uh, and uh, that we were we were evolving in this uh, area from from these different levels of consciousness. And so Troward laid out an entire um, uh, methodology in which we could live as mystical spiritual beings from uh, from from this divine consciousness. And he laid out the entire process uh, for us. And it's all there in the seven books that Troward uh, wrote. Um, he believed, Troward, the, the interesting thing is Troward did believe that he believed in personal immortality. And he did believe that if we learned enough, we wouldn't have to die. Unfortunately, uh, Troward, uh, didn't totally embody all that because when he was 69 years old, which was, you know, still fair, not, 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 not really old, that, that old at the time, people were living longer than that. Uh, he passed from, he passed from this scene. And um, so, and that, that was 1915. Um, so, I mean, that, that gives you a little, a uh, little background of um, the life of, Troward. He he was um, he was married twice. Uh, he had uh, four daughters, two by his first marriage and two by his second marriage. Uh, he was said to be kind of a trickster. Um, he he loved to play practical jokes. Um, he had this. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, there are different stories about uh, one time he. He came and he got to the wrong house. He thought he was in his house and he was in the neighbor's house. And he thought he would play a trick on his kids. And so he was down on his hands and knees acting like an animal. And a woman whose, <laughs> whose house it actually was came in the living room and saw this man that she didn't recognize bellowing like an elephant. Uh, scared the heck out of her. Um Things like that, and then he he played tricks with his uh, with his children, and uh, so he pe people liked him. I mean, he 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 had a twinkle in his eye all the time. I don't think he ever took himself too seriously, um, even though what he wrote was very serious. So that's kind of uh, you know, I mean, he was in he was an Englishman. He was a proper Englishman, but at the same time. He was sort of a comedic, uh, proper Englishman. So. And, he, and he had such a such an interesting um, growing up, you know, to be in England and to be in India and to have that yeah. understanding of of different cultures and different ideas of theology and religion. And yeah. I'm wondering if he had a direct mystical experience himself. 
if of any way of any sort do you know if he did if that spot he did he, he 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 did but he didn't really he didn't really talk about those things because because his most of the things that he wrote about were left brain they were they were analysis so i mean if for example if you compare uh troward to emerson emerson was emerson was about feeling was about uh was was about ex experiencing the divine where troward was more about analyzing it so troward if you look at Troward's work, he doesn't spend time talk about talking about the, the experience himself, but what the experience meant. Um, he he was much more interesting in a step by step process by which we could live our lives as uh, spiritual beings. Um, so in that sense, he wasn't he. In that sense, Troward would not be considered a quote mystic, um, although he most of those kinds of experiences he kept he kept private to himself. One thing he did do that, uh, and 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 Ernest Holmes talked about this a lot: the difference between mysticism and psychism. Uh, Troward was very interested in uh, psychic phenomena and. Um, there were experiences that he did that he talked about where he was in two different places at one time. Uh, people actually saw him in Scotland when he was in England, and they actually conversed with him in Scotland. And so he commented on those kinds of ideas where he he was in he apparently transcended time and space. Um, and he, he he talked about a lot. One of those, one of the real interesting ones where Troward was with his, I believe it was his first wife, and they were in India at the time, and uh, they had been on vacation and had, and were staying at a um at a like a hostel or um uh or some kind of vacation home. But anyway, the um Troward's wife was in this other room and um, all of a sudden he heard a shriek and uh, it was like she she screamed and he ran into the other room and um, he said, what happened? And uh, his wife said that uh, there was a man who stood over her bed with a gun and uh, and just scared the heck out of her. And the next morning they actually talked to the wife and uh, the and Troward's wife described the man she saw, and, she, and and the woman said, "Oh yeah, that was my, that was my late husband. He committed suicide in this room," uh, and she absolutely described him. So things like that. So um, Troward was interested in those kinds of things that that we have the ability to look at different dimensions and different time sequences about uh, various things and. Holmes made that distinction between the mystical and 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 the psychic. In the in the psychic, those things are recorded in what's called universal subconscious mind. Um, uh, the mystic is transcends the uh, subconscious mind and actually is talks about unity and oneness. Wow! Thank you for sharing those stories. Oh my gosh! And I love that distinction of what Troward would look into the um, the more psychic realm, you know, in addition to the mystical realm. And um, I have from the Science of Mind Archives website, we have a little article about Ernest Holmes. And he and Ernest says, the thing I like about Troward is that he gives a scientific or logical explanation of whatever he claims. Take the idea of unity, for example. He quotes from the ancient teachers of India, the Vendatis, if I'm saying that right, saying that it's impossible to have two infinities, for if there were two, neither of them could be infinite, therefore there is only one. Right. And so just, just that oneness. And and I love how Ernest really, you know, drank from Troward and just really utilized yeah. that in his teaching. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the interesting things is when you get a perspective from a farther distance, you... 
you have the opportunity, for example, to con compare and contrast Troward to an Indian mystic, Sri Aurobindo, who also influenced Dr. Holmes. And the interesting thing about it is their lives paralleled. They were on the planet at the same time. But um, and, and Aurobindo was from a very wealthy family in India. So when Aurobindo was five years old in, in India, he also went to England and he also took a classical English education, didn't have anything to do with spirituality, was just the classical education. When Aurobindo was 18 or 19 years old, he came back to India um, and he he became a, a actually a revolutionary. At first, he was a revolutionary because remember in India at that time, around 1902 uh, to 1905 or so, um, there was they wanted to uh, to get rid of the the English, and there were Indian revolutionaries. And actually, Arbindo was tried. He was tried as a as a terrorist. Um, he was acquitted. Um, but you can see the whole life of Arabindo, uh compare it to the life of Troward. One was an Indian, uh, one was an Englishman, and they came up with the same, same conclusions. That's the interesting thing. They came up with the same spiritual conclusions, even though they had totally different lives. Which verified what what Holmes was wow. saying. Holmes says there's only one truth, and and so it would stand to reason that that people who experience this truth would come up with the same uh, conclusions. We kind of see that uh, with Emerson and Quimby as well, you know, living in, in, geographically in the same place around the same time, discovering and unfolding their, their ideas of truth at the same time. It's incredible how when we when we delve into what was happening and um, how people were, well, that must have been a psychic something that also psychic there because there was tuning into that objective and in, into race consciousness of of what right. was wanting to to come through as well. Right. And I'm wondering what. What we, what you would say, um, what you would state that Thomas Troward's main teaching is? Well, uh, I did a class a few years ago, because quite a, probably 15, 20 years ago, um, at a Silomar, uh, and I was asked to break down uh, the entire teaching of Thomas Troward and present it in like an hour and a half or two hours. And and so uh, what I did is I came up with uh, 18 different points uh, that I presented. And uh, I have been using those 18 different points to point out the, the, the variations in Troward because he's, he is, has so rich in the uh, material. I'll just give you an example. For example, he, he came up with the idea of the reciprocal relationship between the universal and the individual, which is a very important idea that uh, conjures up the idea of uh, prayer and worship uh, and then and the idea of spiritual mind treatment, the idea of how love works with law. Um, so that was part of that, the, this reciprocal relationship. He he had an idea of where we're going uh, when he wrote about the, the coming of the divine kingdom and explained uh, that that we're moving to the next dimension of who we are as spiritual beings. And, and that's why science of mind is a very practical teaching um, because, because Troer laid out methodology uh, whereby whereby if we followed this methodology, we could, we could open ourselves up to this uh, spiritual basis that would push us and move us to the next dimension of who we are. And that, the, that, that our purpose is not a merging into to cosmic oneness, but our purpose in science of mind and in higher thought is to live our lives here on planet Earth 
but to live as spiritual beings and bringing in this bringing in this divine kingdom so that we're actually living in a divine kingdom on planet earth that's the goal at this point now after that period there's there are other periods and Trower, for example talked about the doctrine of the octave uh how things produce he talked about how involution and evolution work um so that god involves itself into creation and so creation can evolve back into god uh, many of those things. So th those were those were a few of those things, but there there were like 18 different points, and I, I've got them written down. So if you want to uh, talk about any uh, any one particular point, uh, I'll, I'll just mention a couple that's really important. One is called the personal factor, uh, and that's where Troer talks about people coming into the realization that they are actually contributing uh, towards their own uh, life by the by their thinking in other words that 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 we begin to realize that our that what we're thinking about actually affects what is happening in our life and that we can consciously begin to do it with the with the personal factor um, he talked about principle and precedent um, and his famous statement there is principle is not bound uh, by precedent. In other words, principle is is coming from the uh, the the absolute knowingness of spirit, where precedent is things that have happened before. So we can live our life based on what's happened before, or we can um, kind of open ourselves to the to the unlimited uh, realization of of spirit. Uh, he talked about and, uh, and, uh, just real quick, yeah. Dr. Tom, I love both of those that you just said, the personal factor and that principle is not bound by precedent. Right. I mean, to me, that's how we co-create with spirit. And you right. also said we're living as spiritual beings now. And so I think that's what gives people hope when they like in their family life, you know, like all the women had cancer. So I'm going to get cancer, you know, so we can stop that and say, wow, you know, that's precedent but in this moment you know we use our personal factor in this moment i choose i choose to know that i am healthy and right. happy and move forward and that we can ab absolutely influence our lives which is so uh pivotal in science of mind and spirit teachings and so i think those are two really important i mean i think they give people hope <laughs> you know and sure. it's beyond hope when you learn these principles you use them we co-create with right. our personal factor of we get to choose we get to choose our lives we get to choose how we want to express and show up and influence the world yeah i mean there's a simple statement that says when your hair is messed up you don't try to comb the mirror um like which which is which really tells you that, see, what most people do is they react to what has already happened in the world. And they, 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 will, they will then create their life on the basis of their reactions. And so we, you know, we're, we're, we try to seek meaning out of what's going on, but we're always looking at what has already happened instead of looking at what the possibilities are. And that's what Trower tried to direct us to is those spiritual possibilities and to take our attention away from what has already happened the question is not uh what has happened the question is how do we creatively and lovingly respond to 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 what is going on and and to always come from that place that we're spiritual beings having a human experience and that that, that we're con we're continually asking ourselves what is the what is the highest kindest most compassionate way we can live and of course it's not that easy to do all the time because we're we're bombarded by uh, all of these things that are occurring in time and space um but those are all secondary things well, compared to the primary idea and i and i'd like to i mean i i acknowledging that people have uh, watching here and we have people interacting and, and yes we're going to get to some of these comments and questions and and it's welcome everybody here onto this wisdom of the mystics program here with 
with uh, Dr. Tom Sanna. This is such an interesting conversation emerging about Thomas Troward. Now, I have one thing I really would love to ask you. I remember in class, you talked a lot about, well, not a lot, but you did talk about the idea that this teaching is mystical teaching and a mystical unfoldment and we're folding and as we lean into um this teaching new thought science of mind the teachings of child from the idea of mysticism not only uh, manifesting you know what 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 we desire to right. manifest as in the physical when we kind of move through that and past that and come to that place where this is a this is about our divinity um and i believe that many people who discover new thoughts um, in a way want to change their lives of course because they want uh they desire a change in their circumstance and could you um maybe talk on that for a little bit and on how to actually get to that place of knowing the mystical sure. and having that yeah. empower our lives. Part of it has to do with the way the, the textbook of Science of Mind was written, so that when you pick up the Science of Mind textbook and when you teach the teach at the beginning, you're teaching, you're teaching the metaphysical part. But actually, Science of Mind is in two parts. It's the mystical and the metaphysical. So. So when you, when you look at spiritual mind treatment, the first thing you want is you want communion with this universal spirit. To have communion with universal spirit, you have to have a mystical inclination where, you're, where your purpose there is, is unity and oneness with spirit. So that when you speak your word, you're coming from spirit. You're not speaking your word from an individual personality. So, so the first part of our teaching is communion and mysticism. And then once we, once we have that oneness, then you move to the metaphysical part, which is, which is the creative process, which is speaking our word uh, into the law of mind. So you have, you have both sides. And, and unfortunately, what's happened in science of mind is that people pick up the metaphysical first and they learn all about treatment and they learn about the creative process. And for some reason, they don't emphasize the mystical. And then, of course, um, there are various reasons for this, but there are some of our teachers that really emphasize the impersonal part of the law and they don't get into the the what's what Troy called infinite personalness and Holmes called it the same thing the infinite personalness of the mystic and so they're they're looking at it only from the metaphysical part and so what happens is we are creating from our own uh, personality desires rather than creating from our our spiritual base. In other words, you have to go through the mystical first in order to speak your word into the metaphysical. So they both have to be there. Such a powerful and important point for Bye. all of our folks who are here. Um, so yeah, definitely. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you know, and, and so we do have a couple questions here. This could be good. So I think you might know uh, Michael Mangus. Uh, yeah, yeah. He has a question, if you can see it. Um, was yeah, I Jen can see oh, that. Oh, Pastor Michael. <laughs> I know it's Pastor Michael. Uh, yeah, he says, was author Genevieve uh, Breland uh, his only personal student, as she claimed? The answer is no. Um, she, he, well, you know, depending on what her definition of personal student was, she wrote a book. The thing about the thing about uh, Harry Gazy, we have two people that really comment on uh, Troward. One was Harry Gazy, and the other is uh, Gen uh, Genevieve Breland. And when you read them, I mean, they both give in interesting information, but they both get caught up in their own uh, their own personalities. Um, Gazy was was interesting because he actually. Uh, 
he actually was a teacher and that he he actually influenced Troward uh, more than Gen uh, Genevieve was a student of Troward, um, but she wasn't she was not the not the only student. But but both of their books are worth reading. So I, I have to tell you, I, I have to uh, I, every time I go back to her, I have to go back and start rereading her material because uh, for some reasons, a lot of her stuff doesn't stick with me that much. So what was the other author's name, please? Harry Gazy, G-A-Z, Gazy, G-A-Z-E, uh, -E, yeah. And he was really important. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Harry Gazy was in the United States and um, somewhere around 1898 or somewhere around there. And he went to a he went to a seminar in the United States uh, that, where a man named uh, Hudson. No, Hudson Thompson or Thompson Hudson, I get him mixed up. Anyway, he's he was he was speaking, and he wrote a book uh, uh, called the, something with the subconscious mind. Um, and at any rate, Gazy took uh, Hudson Thompson's book and gave it to Troward. And without going into a lot of detail, Troward used part of that book uh, for his writings of the Edinburgh lectures. And the the basic issue in involved whether or not universal mind was uh impersonal only but, but was was both personal and impersonal anyway it's it's worth reading and definitely uh Troward was influenced by both Gazy and uh and Hudson Thompson or Thompson Hudson whoever he was <laughs> I, I I wish they would just have first <laughs> names and second names but they're uh, <laughs> I can't remember one one or the other, but anyway. So, so Troward was influenced by Gazy to some to some extent, and then oh. and then Gazy 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 said he was a personal friend of Troward also, which he was. Alrighty, thank you. Uh, I see Ray McLeod writes uh, was. Uh, Troward a Mason. Um, I I don't think he I don't think he was deeply involved as a Mason, but he certainly understood the Masonic teaching. Um, he was much closer. Troward was much closer to a Rosicrucian than a Mason. And if you look at uh, if you look at Troward's works, he talks about. Uh, much more about the Rosicrucians and uh, what's what Troward calls the artist Elias, a very interesting term. Um, and Troward seems to endorse the idea of this um, uh, of this idea of this artist Elias who would move us to the next dimension of who we are. And he got that uh, he got that from the uh, from the Rosicrucian uh, movement. And you have to remember, I'm the talking off the top of my Elias. head. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, A L I A S, Elias, yeah. And and I'm talking off the top of my oh, head he because I haven't looked at the oh, material. God. So, yeah. Uh, so, so I don't, I don't think he was, I don't think he was a Mason. But he knew about he knew about the Masons, of course. Thank you. Sure. I, I, I was going to ask you that, um, Jim, because it it feels as if Thomas Troud's work is so intense, so deep, and so mystical. And I I was just wondering how where really how was he inspired to understand in such depth. Such a body of work, and well, to be able first of to, all, to, um, to bring this yeah. forward. Well, there is an inclination. Uh, Troward was an attorney too. You know, he he was he was a judge, and he had a legal mind. And so, any anybody who really gets deep into the idea of 
of an attorney. What they want, what they want to do is they want to figure out the lay of the land. They want to figure out what comes first, what comes second, and they, they want to create this this step by step approach. Um, to, to and and it, anybody who goes into it with any in any depth, what they want to find out is how the how the law works from from the beginning. It's not just analyzing statutes. It's going going to the basic of of it. Where do they come from? Where do, how how does the law evolve from the beginning? Uh, through the process. And so Troward, Troward knew how to do that. And, um, and when you're trained that way, you're, you're, you're trained to look for the, the methods by which, by, by which the, the universe is explained. And so in some, some sense, it's like a physicist, like a, and that's why one of the interesting and intriguing things is that it were called science of mind for a reason. And that is because Holmes believed that what we believe spiritually is compatible with science. And so that you can look to science and that you should have a compatibility between our spirituality and, and science. And, and, and if there isn't a compatibility, you have to take a, a hard look and say, where is it? So what is unique about what is unique about our teaching? We could be just any kind of faith. We could be, we could just say we believe this because we believe it on the basis of faith. But science of mind goes one step further. They they say we believe this because it is consistent with the with the way the universe works, not just spiritually, but scientifically. And that's why it's very interesting when you get into quantum physics, which Holmes really was not involved with very much because it came later. But, but that's where the challenge is, is that our teaching is, our teaching is consistent with some of the latest findings in quantum physics. You know, the idea that the idea that yeah. Trower talked about the idea that there's just this spiritual energy that is a potential of all possibility but this spiritual energy becomes something when it is observed, just as a wave yes. becomes a particle when it is observed. So it's very similar. Yes, I, I've written that down. I've written quantum physics down here and, 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 and was just intrigued as to how Thomas Troward may have, what well, he may have, um, well, it was aligned, and he knew, and uh, and and I wonder what he would have, if he were here now, what he would be saying about quantum physics. Well, I'm sure he would have written a book, and he would have compared quantum physics yeah. to <laughs> uh, to his findings of spiritual science, and he would have shown uh, how they're compatible. Remember, he died in 1916, so um, that was before any of this material became public. And that's why Troward, for example, at Holmes, to a certain extent, used the word ether. Um, we try not to use that word anymore because, because it's, it's basically been discredited in science. Um, it was, it was the idea that, the, that light had a medium um, called ether and that light moved within this medium. Well, uh, they they showed, and especially Einstein showed that there is no medium that light moves at a, at one particular. The speed of light is constant. Just one little thing there. But that's the cool thing about the science of science of mind, and all the theories and philosophies. And I just think that there's a it's kind of it's not ironic, but like how. Thomas Trover talked about the impersonal law of the universe is creative. And so for a lawyer and a judge to talk about the law, you know, so as we right. talk about the law that is impersonal, that, you know, we speak our word into the law that brings it back fulfilled or always uh, listens to our word. I just think that 
I understand it's one of the powerful influences on Ernest Holmes was one of was hello I can't talk right now it's gone um, is this concept yes yes yeah the the yeah and that's why that's why when we talk about faith for example in science of mind well we it's one of the more difficult concepts to teach because I there's there's faith there's faith in derogation of reason and then there's faith that transcends reason and people don't it's hard to understand that but you know a Pentecostal person could have could have faith and they could uh, for example I don't know if it, this is necessarily Pentecostal but there are some teachings that says that the earth is only 8,000 years old. And, um, but we can scientifically show that the earth is much, much older than that. And we can prove it through fossil records, uh, just as we can prove uh, the theory of the Big Bang is not just a theory. I mean, we can show because of a lot of evidence that there was such a thing. Uh, so our teaching has to be consistent with science that is proven. And so we can't just say, well, I believe the earth is uh, 8,000 years old because that's my faith and that's how I that's how I interpret the Bible. Well, if we taught that, it would make us no different than any other particular religion. But we say we only use faith where it transcends reason, where reason cannot answer the question it's the same thing with does god exist or does god not exist well if you look at it very clearly and you look at all of the arguments you come up with the conclusion that we cannot show through reason whether god exists or not you can't show it through reason because reason is indigenous in the whole process so you you're left with this question and I followed it through with a lot of people who, who are non-believers, and they don't want to take the leap of faith. In other words, they can be shown that in order to believe, really believe in God to be a personal presence in their life, they have to take the leap of faith. In other words, it's a leap into the unknown. Reason cannot support it, but it, but it's a it's a question of of is it there? And that's what St. Anselm said when he said, I believe that I may know. Well, what does he mean? He meant that once you take the leap of faith, then a whole new vista of spirituality opens up to you. And if you're not willing to take that, then you're left with your own existential way of looking at the world rather than having a power and a presence of spirit that oversees the whole process. And a lot of people don't want don't want to do that. They because because they they don't know. But the thing is, once you take the leap, and of course, mystical experience will help you to do that because you can't you can't know spirit unless you can't know it at, at depth unless you've had some kind of experience of it, or just a, a deep leap leap of faith. And that's what the that's really what it, it boils down to. Um, and I've tried to, um, I've talked to a lot of people about that and some people are unwilling to do it because it doesn't, they can't prove it. You cannot prove it with rationality. I was just going to, I was just going to, to add that on and to ask you, because I know we have that. About to 11 minutes left. This is so interesting. I was just wanting to ask you then, that that's the point where maybe science and spirituality are, well, there's an opportunity for that deeper kind of union of the two, because that's the point where we're asked to go beyond logic and beyond reason and take that leap of faith, where we, we can't see that this has been scientifically proven where we're yeah. actually we're delving into the mystical here um that's right and that's the part that many people are you know unwilling yeah. to or not ready to, to and that to was the whole into. thing about yeah and that was the whole thing about emma curtis hopkins teaching her her teaching was 
you will you you will see what you believe. In other words, you have to believe it in order to see it. Uh, so that so that if you don't see the presence of a the presence of a loving creative God, if you don't see it in your own mind, you're not gonna you're not gonna believe it because you're because it it doesn't become real to you. But if you're willing to take that leap of faith, then all of a sudden it pours. And you actually have that experience. Ernest Holmes could not have had mystical experiences unless he believed that they were possible. And since so, so it's like wow. self-fulfilling process. Person, a person who is a materialist says, Well, it has to be materialism because that's what we see. But but the but the idealist says, go beyond that, take that leap. And the materialist says, I'm not taking that leap. Because I can't, I can't see it. Because, I, because, see, what are they looking at? They're looking at precedent. They're looking at what's already happened. Mm -hmm. And we're saying you got to take the leap to yes. to begin to experience that. Yeah, if you want a miracle in your life, if you want to have something happen that you you've never experienced before you need to take that leap of faith yeah. and in and to know that it can be possible you don't have to know how you know you just have to know that it's possible for something greater and like you're saying it's 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 going to a whole nother level of consciousness and experience in life and um, and I think that, I mean, and I know we've talked actually quite a, a lot about how this teaching is practical, but so what, what advice would you give to our viewers of how this teaching is practical and applicable for people today? Well, one of the things I would say is that you have to develop what's called the observer self. And what that means is you have to be able to step outside of yourself and watch your behavior in a non-judgmental way. You have to be willing to have the courage to say, in my actions as a human being, am I violating some basic ideas of like empathy, of kindness, of compassion, uh, my emotions, am I, am, do my negative emotions begin to control me? So you have to be really honest with yourself and you have to list those things that that are compatible with what it what it means to be a spiritual being and then you have to say am i living my life that way and you can do that it's not that easy to do it and it's nice it's much nicer to be able to do it if you have a partner or somebody who is doing it with you because they'll call you on it They'll, they'll say, you know, you're out of principle. Um, uh, so it's, it's not that easy to do, but you, 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 you say, how does a spiritual being behave? And then you start behaving that way. And it's really that simple. And then, and then you, 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 you realize that you don't compartmentalize because we believe in unity and oneness. So you don't compartmentalize and say, I'm going to act this way in this situation and another way in another situation. We want to act as spiritual beings all the time. So compassion, kindness, gratitude, forgiveness, empathy, all of those things that really make for the real spiritual being, we want to develop and embody those ideas and live from those ideas. So it's not theoretical. It's very practical. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Tom here and for sharing with us today and for everybody that's watching viewing and the questions and comments that have come in we really really value you for being here and and and, and i'm sure that you've gleaned from this amazing conversation with dr tom sanna on uh, thomas troward and um dr sanna i'm just I, I have your book up here the complete works of thomas troward this is your writing yes years of researching and understanding Thomas Troward. Um, where can people find your book? 
Oh, uh, well, the best way to find it is just send me an email and uh, and I'll Thank yeah, you. I'll get it to you. I think I, I think we're selling it for twenty dollars right now. Fantastic. And do you have more classes coming up where you're teaching this that people can yes. go in with? Yes, um, uh, I'm working with Seaside uh, Seaside Spiritual Center, and we're teaching a class called Roots of mm -hmm. Science of Mind, which is uh, Troward is one of the roots. So we talk about all of the different um, foundations of uh, the teaching, where it came from, and that's going to be starting next Wednesday night. No, I'm sorry, next Tuesday night. Uh, at Seaside uh, with the, with the Zoom also, and then on Wednesday nights, I'm starting a class with Emma Curtis Hopkins and Thomas Troward, comparing and contrasting the two. Uh, and every Wednesday night, I have a class, oh, so anyone amazing. anyone can join those. And I've that been at this from. I think there's a little delay. Yeah, I was able to go to Dr. Tom's extension study course to the Science of Mind textbook that Ernest created. And I can't even tell you, I mean, how much you really, by taking classes with Dr. Tom, you can really deepen into the teaching. And it's a community. You connect with these beautiful souls, and we're all learning together. And Dr. Tom is just masterful at just creating a loving, supportive, safe environment to learn and grow. And it's so much more than just you know, the line by line, like teachings is how can we use it in our lives? And so I'm very grateful for you, Dr. Tom. You're welcome. Wonderful. Yes, I know Pastor Mike is a part of your, your group as well. And uh, he might be popping on here after the show to say hi to you. So, um, okay. so I just want to say thank you from my heart. But a question, just because we have about two minutes left if you could recommend one book one thomas Troward book or reading mm. for somebody that has not read any of thomas Troward's work before or is interested and wants to read another book what would you recommend well first i'd recommend an essay called threefold man it's a very short essay it's only about two pages long and it is kind of like the whole thing in a nutshell it's called Threefold Man. And the second one, I think the second one was is a kind of a fascinating is The Law and the Word uh, by Troer. To go through that book, and then that will open you up to a lot of other questions, too. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Dr. Tom has just been such an amazing supporter of the Science of Mind archives and uh, providing us different resources and tools. And, you know, the archives, our website, scienceofmindarchives.com, is just a wealth of information as well to help people deepen into these wonderful mystics that change our lives. And so we encourage you to check that out, too. And I bet Laura has something to say about New Thought Media Network. Oh, yeah. Check out Science of Mind Archives. Absolutely. There is so much there. It's incredible. I'm always on that website uh, delving into the content. And of course, yes, we are uh, here with New Thought Media Network, which is a, a CSL, Center for Spiritual Living, Focus Ministry, online sharing teachings every single day of the year in different ways. And you are welcome and invited to uh, to understand even more deeply for yourself the reciprocal process, <laughs> and to donate into uh, our there we go the donation link there at ntmedia.org. And if this feeds you, uh, then know that uh, you can be involved by by gifting of your treasure into the network because we're doing so many amazing things and we have a big vision for uh, unfolding, I think. And thank you, Dr. Tom Sana, for being here and being so generous with the mystics. 
welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone who is here. Have a wonderful blessed day and we will awesome. see you next time here at Wisdom of the Mystics. Yeah. Well. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye for now.